now work on something called tritium. So um, what I decided to do uh, was to give you sort of a, um, a deep dive into the different systems, but not very deep, really. Uh, a brief introduction to how uh, Tricoder and then something called ShipShape and Tritium, what they look like and what they do, uh, and sort of s how we migrated ideas from one system to another one. So um, this is the title of the talk. And, and uh, I also like this one, but I actually didn't think of it before. So I sort of like to think of these little analyzers as little robots helping you while you're working. So they will give you advice uh, in code review or, or other places in your developer workflow. Um, so, right, so this is going to be about usability and code analysis, because that is the goal of these systems I will be talking about. Uh, it'll gonna be it's going to be a brief look into three systems, Tricoder, ShipShape, and Tricium, and I'll give you more details later, obviously. Uh, these systems have similar goals, uh, but they work in different landscapes. And that's sort of part of the experience uh, that we've had, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about, sort of the experience of you know, looking at these different landscapes and building a system for them. And then sort of how the ideas from initially Tricoder was sort of migrated to ShipShape and then Tricium, which is this, the most recent edition. So right, so first Tricoder. And um, if you're a Trekkie, you may have seen this before. So a Tricoder is a thing from Star Trek. And to be honest, I didn't notice uh, starting on a Tricoder team, <laughs> but I see some people do. Uh, so the thing with the Tricoder is that you point it at things and it will tell you what they are or something like this, right? So, so that's the idea behind this pipeline. You will, so you are in code review, perhaps, and then you're looking at a patch or a change or whatever you want to call them, change list. And then uh, the robots will help you to say what, they, what they're seeing. So, so that's the background for the logo. Um, right, so Tricoder is the internal static analysis pipeline running at Google. Um, and you can read more about most of the things I'm going to say about Tricoder is from a paper that was presented at ICSI last year. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the goal of this pipeline is to produ produce uh, analysis results in, in the appropriate places in the developer workflow. So taking care of the integration, and then people who want to contribute to the system can do so. So the system has the goal of also making it easy to contribute for, for people working, uh, for this in this case, internally in Google. Anyone can sort of say, I see this problem here. I would want to help other people see to see it as well, right? And then help them fix it. So those things are typically the case where you would go to Tricoder and try to add this analysis and, and try to help your fellow developers. So what does it look like to make it a little bit more concrete? So the main integration point here in the developer workflow is code review. And code review is central to development at Google. It's been there from the very, very beginning. And it's, it's something that's required for all changes. You need to go through this tool. Um, where at least one or more people need to look at what you're changing. So while you're in that uh, code review mode, you get typically, or in the tool, you'll see something like a diff, you know, someone's changing something, the green stuff is new, the red stuff is going away, that sort of diff view, and you can add comments. So this is what you'll see in tools like Garrett and Retweld, which are spin-offs of internal tooling that is being used. Um, so you add comments, and, and in this case, the system will insert robot comments as well. So we have two comments here, or examples uh, of comments. Uh, so a simple lint comment, which, uh, you know, in this case, you're missing a Java doc. Um, and I'll, I'll comment on the different pieces here. Uh, but the second one is something from error prone, which is uh, an analysis, uh, a Java C compiler extension, wh where you can plug in several analysis. It's actually a little ecosystem of its own for, for Java. So, so Java error prone is saying something about string comparison, right? So. Uh, in the case with error prone, it's, it's saying that, okay, this is a problem, you can read more about it here, and then uh, if you want to, I can suggest a fix for you. Um, and if you, if you click that button, you'll get something like this where it's saying, okay, this is your code uh, in the code that you changed, and I would want to change it to this thing here. And you could have more than one suggestion here, and you can pick the one that you like the most. And another thing, uh, important thing for this system, so it, you have the comments, you have the suggestions, um, you start to sort of have an interaction with the robot and so on. But if you don't like the, what it's saying, you have the option of saying not useful. And that's very, very interesting and, and useful. That's why the system has been successful, is because users, have, they've been able to say, I don't like this result. And if they want to, they can even provide more information. So when you click this not useful uh, link in this case, you, you, you give a signal and we count the clicks. 
you know, um, as an indicator. But you can also file a bug in this case uh, internally and say, I don't like this because of this and that, right? And then you can start the conversation. So there are examples where uh, error prone, for instance, re released a new check and they were getting a lot of not useful feedback from the users. They were like, we, we don't understand what's wrong, right? So they were looking at the feedback from the users and then they realized that they're not understanding what we're saying. So the message needs to be adapted, right? Because they were actually not disagreeing with the analysis. They were just not understanding it, right? So they were rephrasing the message and then suddenly all the not useful clicks just went away. So that was a good example of where Aeroprone, who which was one of the earlier analyzers in Tricoder, they were listening to the users and they were up updating the analysis and, and then you know ended up with a better result. Um, right, and then uh, finally here, uh, just going through the different links here, uh, please fix, that's just a way to say, for the reviewer in this case, you can say, well, I'm reviewing this code, the robot's saying this, please fix what the robot is saying, right? As a way of saying, I also agree with what this robot is saying, right, to the user. Uh, the author of the change. All right, so uh, I, w I mentioned we have different landscapes here. So uh, f this is internal to Google. So uh, typically then you have the Google landscape to, to deal with and it's a big one, right? So and, and you there's an article in Wired where you can read more about this. It was uh, released last year uh, where they say that the code base is actually two billion lines of code. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of activity. So you see there's 45,000 commits or so a day uh, and these are from the paper, so maybe more now, who knows, right? Uh, we have about 25,000 developers. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, uh, so that's sort of the, how, how fast things progress, but then we also have this code review process, as I mentioned. Um, to, so yeah, and then also some more numbers to kind of, so we have a lot of changes coming in, but they tend to be small, but st we have some extreme ones, so you can see that. Typically, you'll, you'll touch one file in one language, but there's the extreme case where you're touching 22 different languages in the same change, now are you touching 333,000 files in the same change? That does not sound like a human to me, but maybe there's robots changing the code base as well. And that is, that is the case here. Um, right, so th that is sort of kind of like the landscape. It's big. Um, in the past, Google tried to use analysis tools internally, things like find bugs, and you can find papers about the experience. Um, things that were problematic were scale. Uh, was scaling because uh, the tools could were maybe assuming that we can get the whole repository into our tool and then we'll anal analyze things. Doesn't work in this case. So it's just a technical thing. You will have to just redesign some parts, perhaps, right? And then second thing was uh, workflow integration. Many of the tools were things you had to you know, actively run. So you have a change, you have to run the tool and then you sort of iterate and then you pass it on to re review. And that just ends up not happening. So, so that's another problem. You have to sort of get make it automatic was one of the takeaways. Um, and then finally, false positives. So the tools were just being a bit too noisy. And when things are noisy, you start stop paying attention. And, and that's the background for the not useful click, which is kind of like central to the idea behind uh, the tracker the system. Right, so, so the development with, uh, so moving, so in this landscape, adding tricoder to this mix, uh, where the end result is that tricoder is producing these ro robot comments in code review. Um, they suggest fixes as I saw you, you, you I, s I showed you some examples. Uh, we collect the feedback and uh, based on what people are clicking, um, um, there's a rate of false positive rates that's computed and we try to keep it all under 10%. So the way that works is that there's a sort of like a dashboard for all the analyzers and the ones that tend to go beyond this limit, they end up on the naughty list. And then on the naughty list, you start to have a conversation. And <laughs> if people are not behaving, uh, basically if the maintainer of the analyzer, they're not listening to what people are saying and it's, it's being too noisy, uh, the tricoder team turns off the analyzer. Sort of with, so the decision here is to switch to the users rather than the analyzer writers. So even if they're compiler experts, if the users are not liking this, we turn it off. So it's kind of like an added benefit, but if it's noisy, it goes away. Um, and then you have some numbers. So Tricoder is constantly running, analyzing all the things. And uh, we, there's, there's a whole bunch of results, findings, results being produced every day. And, um, and then, you know, again, each change is kind of small. So the average or the median in this case is one, but the average is 14. So sometimes these things go up. And, but on average, there's, there's not that many changes, but there's usually some, I mean findings, but there's usually some kind of finding we found. Right. Um, so another thing. Uh, so uh, around the system is to contribute, like the, f the fact that the team is kind of small maintaining the system, um, but, the, and, but still there's a lot of different analyzers and those are actually being added by people outside the team. So the team tries, they sort of one of the goals is to make it easy to contribute 
so you can build this ecosystem around uh, the tricoder system. So things like error prone is actually being uh, maintained by someone else. Uh, and then you make sure you have someone to talk to if something goes wrong. Um, and at the time of the paper for Tricutter, when it was written, there was 30 plus or so analyzers in the system. Um, error prone being one, but uh, in Clang Tidy, uh, which is something like error prone for the Clang compiler. Uh, so again, that's like a small ecosystem in itself. You add a whole bunch of Clang Tidy checks and you can configure those things if you want to. Um, and then some other things for other languages. So there's, uh, so uh, as you can see, there's like Java, C++, and Go, and JavaScript, and, and other things happening here. Uh, things you can uh, display findings for in code review, but there's also all kinds of other things in the workflow, for instance. Um, things about build files and all the kinds of glue you need in your, in your uh, development. You can also present findings for those. Right, so uh, for each one, I'm, I was going to give a, like an overview of how it works. Uh, because part of the sort of takeaway is, is sort of how to scale things and so on. So here's here's an overview of uh, a slightly different diagram of what the one of the one you find in the paper, uh, where you can see how this this basic flow works. So uh, and and this is based on code review. So you'll have something coming into code review, you'll get notified of the change, and then that's that 40,000 or so changes every day. So there's just fairly, and then for each of those changes of the 45,000 or so, there's there's uh, many different versions of that change, right? So you have to add a couple of times more. So there's there's a lot of runs here coming in, notifications from the change, uh, that's code review uh, changes coming in, and then you have different stages in this, this pipeline. Um, one thing to note, and then the different workers for the different uh, language runtimes. Uh, so one thing to note is that, um, for instance, there's, there's this Java and C++ and so on workers will be sort of runtimes for your analyzer. So in this system here, you have the option of implementing your analyzer in any runtime that's supported, um, or any sort of, and if you're, um, well, runtime supported, you can actually analyze uh, Java programs in Go if you wanted to and so on. But I don't know, no one really does that, but you could. Uh, and then there's also workers for the various like compiler extensions, which are slightly different in that you sort of have to bring up the compiler front end and uh, then run the extensions. Um, and all of these things are sort of parallel things running uh, in their own, as their own little, uh, in their own little container. It's, a, it's an internal sort of, how the internal systems works and so on. But the thing that I, was, I wanted to mark here with the, the little um, red markers uh, are things where you could scale things up. So if you knew that you had a lot of uh, linter work coming in, you could just have like a uh, hundred of those while you only have like four of the Java C compiler. And, and that's a useful way of sort of scaling the system to sort of handle the load as you sort of learn about it. Um, right, and, um, and then, so as I mentioned, there's different stages and the different workers will sort of have a bunch of different analyzers and they will sort of help provide results for the various stages. And the way this works is that when there's a change coming in, uh, the system will ask the analyzers, do you have anything to do for this? Can you do something for this change? So there's, there's gonna be like a should run request and then it's going to collect the results, and then based on that, it's going to send out a second round of uh, analyze requests for that uh, change. So something like uh, someone changing C++ code, that doesn't have to go maybe to the Go worker, unless the Go worker is actually analyzing Java uh, C++ code, which is very rare, and I don't think that happens, right? Uh, and then you would probably go to the Clang worker at some point later. Um, so that's one thing, and the second thing is that these stages will finish uh, at different times, because the file stage is obviously the fastest one. You're just getting files, and you analyze them and send it back. You know, things like lint results where the line length is wrong or stuff like that. That's fairly fast. While going down here to the back end of the pipeline, you would sort of have to wait for a build to happen. You would get to need to have some kind of compilation details and so on. Um, so they will, s but as they go along, they send back results, and they, this error here actually uh, to code review is starts to happen sort of continuously. and. While you're reviewing, you'll see the results coming in as they are ready the, during the review. So you, you will know that they're sort of running, and you'll see when they're done, and they will show up in code review and so on. Um, right, so not useful rate. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, this not useful link, which is kind of central to how the system works. Um, and this is uh, one example for an error prone. I think it's the same one from before, just to remind you what that looks like. Yes. So this rate is being computed by taking the different clicks and then combining them together as a one way of computing these things. It's, it's not perfect in any way. Uh, so let's see, yeah, you see the sort of the formula here. Um, and based on, on that click information, 
uh, we put together statistics for each analyzer. And here, uh, here's one example, and this is all from 2014 uh, for the full year. And this is for error prone. And uh, on, on the left side here, <laughs> we have all the clicks. And on the right side, we have the combination of the clicks. And you can see that error prone was, was uh, below this, this uh, limit. So we didn't have any, any things on the naughty list, I think. Um, and this is probably for all the different checks in, uh, in error prone. That's right. Because error prone has this, uh, it's an extension framework in itself. So it has a long list of smaller little checks, the string comparison being one of those checks. Uh, right, and then, uh, yeah, that's one other, one other graph for all of Tricoder, because Tricoder in itself could just be seen as one analyzer if you wanted to, I guess. Uh, and here you can see over 2014, and then the system was a little bit, uh, it wasn't very old at that time, so it was kind of still working on some things. And you can see that the, um, things being on probation on the naughty list <laughs> were, were going down during the day. I think that's what it's showing, right? So yeah, there were uh, things um, improved over the year, basically. Um, right, so um, running this system, you may wonder what the effect is. So given that Tricoder is a system that's like, it's in production, it's been running for a couple of years and so on, uh, there's a bunch of data. Um, and here's one example, again from the paper, if you want more details, uh, from for Clang Tidy. So, uh, so this is a check where typically, uh, you know, this is a common scenario. You have a little pattern, you want to switch it to something else. So Clang Tidy has one of these checks where you want to get rid of uh, redundant uh, calls to get for, for smart pointers. And you can see a couple of examples here uh, on the slide. And um, th what the diagram is showing here is that for uh, all of the code, uh, all the code base, all of the Google two billion lines of code, we could see uh, for 2014 that uh, entries for, for these unnecessary calls were being added to the code base rapidly during the, we have uh, thousands of them being added uh, for, for many, many weeks. And then w uh, when the check was turned on in Tricoder, you could see that it stopped. So there was a peak and then it, people started seeing warnings in code review uh, and then they stopped adding more. So that's good. But they also started cleaning up things. So they were being taught in code review that this is a pattern we, you don't, you shouldn't do this, do this instead. And then they start to see those things elsewhere and they start to fix things. So we, that's why we see this decrease in the code base, a cleanup effort. Um, so that's interesting because people are being, and then code review is actually a venue for education, which people are seeing now in studies of code review. And, and we see that effect here as well. And you can see other, all these other graphs are just for other clang tidy checks. And you see that things are peaking at some point and then they start to decline. Right, so, so a couple of different things about Tricoder. Um, and I guess the, some of the, uh, as I'll, we'll get to, but some of the takeaways here is kind of like the philosophy behind it and how to, uh, things to think about. So uh, I think one of the three central things for the philosophy is the workflow integration uh, to make it happen. And you know, to think about data-driven usability improvements is super important, think about the user. And then also the third thing would be to then empower users to contribute, make it easy to contribute so they will actually do it. Um, and then there's some things about scalability and, and sort of, you know, uh, think about scale, uh, and, and extensions. Yes. Um, so how fast do you need to provide feedback to the, to the program that you still feel connected to the changes going on? Ah, right. So in, in code review, we have more time. So that's different from like editing, for instance, which is another integration point. But then you have to think about more different, I mean, the performance situation is different. You have to be much faster. So here it can take, uh, there's a limit, like we don't, in Tricoder, I think it's a couple of minutes, and then there's like a no more. If you're if you're slower than that, then then this is not the integration point for you or something like that. So you're gonna get it to within minutes. Yes, in uh, within minutes, yeah. I mean, you can debate what's the best here, but that's that's what's been used so far, right? So definitely, there are things where you want to run things for hours and and uh, present them somewhere. Oh yes. Yes, uh, um, there are several things where it's kind of like um, things that would take too much time. There's, there's all kinds of things like, uh, you know, uh, some of the fussing, I think, would potentially, or coverage. There's been discussions with various teams where it's just like, hmm, we can't really do the computation. The thing you may do sometimes is run it overnight and then try to patch it in um, for certain problems. So there's uh, there was one effort with like getting in profiling information, which is something you would have to run things, and you don't do that here because it takes too much time. But then you try to do it overnight and sort of backfill, 
and then bring the information in and take care of sort of the merging problems you might get. Um, yeah, that's one example where that was too long. Yes, right. Who's using it? Oh, both of them, yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually it's quite common that people would, uh, you put together your change and you, you sort of bundle it together and then uh, then you enter the code review setting before you add reviewers. To sort of just do the basic cleanups. I think people even want you to do that <laughs> because then you have to sort of, you reduce the number of cycles. So it's a, it's a good idea, yeah. Right, so um, moving over to ship shape. Um, so I wanted to mention this because I put it in the abstract, if nothing else. <laughs> so this ship shape, the story behind ship shape uh, is that we wanted to f uh, see we what we could do in terms of a, like an open source tricoder. Uh, so so there, there is now this thing called ship shape, which is the open source version of tricoder, uh, where sort of based on what we learned from the internal system, we were thinking, okay, let's move to ex the external world and build something like this. Um, and the end result, you can have a look, of course, uh, ended up being something where the internal Google parts needed to be stripped, and that means stripping things off. You know, you cannot not reuse the code because things are different. Uh, some parts could potentially be reused, but it ended up being a rewrite in Go uh, rather than other languages being used internally. And uh, some stages, like the dependency stage, I didn't talk much about that. That was stripped out, so um, ended up being just a pre and post build stage which is more in line with what you might sort of look at in Jenkins. Um, other things, there's there's just other tools being used for all kinds of different parts of the pipeline. So uh, one thing, I, I think I mentioned Kite here, and Kite's a system that extracts compilation details. It's a system you can use to uh, build, uh, uh, sort of extract xrefs, cross-references for your repository, for instance. It's actually being used for that for code search for Chromium. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, being used for ship shape so that if you want to run error prone, for instance, you would have to sort of plug in kites somewhere to figure out what to do with the, how, you re how do you replay the compilation to run error prone? You would use kites to sort of answer that question for you. Uh, and that's a totally different setup than internal systems because there's a build service internally and so on. Um, other things that, uh, you know, the exercise of doing this is like looking at the internal, internal data st structures and how things were defined and then extracting those things and bringing them outside which in this case meant bringing some of the protos outside. So internally you would present results in code review and they would be called findings and they would have a certain shape. Uh, those, those things are called notes in chip shape and they are very, very similar. So, uh, and th that sort of proto is one of those things that's been hammered on for, for, <laughs> for a while, just getting all the little things you need in there to, to make the whole integration work. So those things you need to bring outside and, and that's part of the stuff you'll find in, in chip shape. Uh, and then a, a major decision for ShipShape was to go with Docker as a sort of foundation for how to build these things. Because, uh, you know, you would have, you get a kind of like a contribution story, you want to make it easy to con for people to contribute. So, so the idea was to let, let people provide Docker containers, just following the API and, and so on. And, and that would be the way for them to, to add their analyzer. Um, and there was actually then, as you can see, a Splash tutorial on, on ShipShape last year. So if you, and, and that's probably available somewhere. So, uh, and I think actually, well actually the documentation for that is in the repository. So you could see how, if you wanted to add your Docker container, how to go about doing that. Um, right, and then and some, you know, the basically what ShipHip does at this point is that it was looking for integration points and it ended up being something where uh, it integrates into Jenkins via a command line interface. Um, and then, and that's sort of the kind of way you would experience ShipShape at this point. Um, and then uh, using Docker, this little CLI sort of brings up uh, a service which is running inside ship, uh, a Docker container. And, and then, you know, in addition, it would bring up any extensions that people have been adding to ShipShape um, and so on. So using Docker again as this uh, extension mechanism. Right. So, um, okay, so sort of a, as a way of comparing to uh, what the structure for internal tracker looked like. This is the architecture for external ship shape. Um, and I guess one, one thing that's different here to, to highlight that is that these, uh, so this is a Docker container, the gray thing here, uh, and the analyzer dispatcher thingy up here with the all the red little dots here indicate things you could scale up. Talking about scalability in microservices, those would be the things. So these little things here actually live in the same box. So that's one of those things where they are actually a little bit too tightly uh, put together, perhaps, in comparison to tricoder. Um, 
So those would correspond to these different workers you saw on the bottom there, where you could actually have many, many, many lint workers if you wanted to. Uh, they are more tied together to this pipeline service, which is corresponds to this service here. Um, as I mentioned, there are, there are fewer stages here. There's the pre, these, these things over here show kind of like the, uh, this, the flow of the CLI over here. So you would uh, put together a request for, to analyze something before you build something, basically just looking at files, and then you would request compilation information using this, this kite, uh, which is also open source, by the way, framework, which in, in this case actually runs in its own Docker container. Um, and then, you know, once you get that information, you feed that into a request, and then you send that to the service, uh, letting it give you post-build analysis results, perhaps via this Java C dispatcher, and then results are being fed back to the CLI and then to the user. And, and that's sort of how that works. So there's really no uh, code review integration here, which is uh, perhaps a problem for, for ShipShape, but it's open source, so someone could, could add this. Um, right, and then there's other kind of like dockery things here. If, if you could look at, you could, well, let me know if you want to know more about that. Yes. Right, so uh, the, the only kind of like uh, caching between, the, the, the thing that happens if you run the CLI once, um, it'll, it'll keep it running for the next one. So in that sense, it's, it's doing something, keeping the Docker uh, container up and running as a service, uh, instead of just like uh, using it as a call back and forth. Uh, but in terms of caching, uh, Right, well, uh, it's, not, um, it's not caching in between runs. It's more that I don't know exactly what you want to cache. It's sort of like doing analysis on a file basis. So it's not, uh, I don't know what kind of things. It's not trying to do anything clever with like compilation details or anything like this. Uh, the only thing it's actually doing is not restarting itself every time. So that could be the worst scenario, probably. Uh, just keeping it up and running is always something. So there's, there's lots of things you could maybe improve in, in ShipHip. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ah, right. Right, right. No, no, no. Nothing, nothing clever like that, really. Uh, there's, there's. Uh, you could, you could definitely look into some of these things. Uh, I think it would be a trade-off of, uh, you know, benefit versus uh, work. Uh, um, how much work would it be to fix and, and all that? Um, but you know, it is so this one, uh, this Java C dispatcher, it's, it's just using error-prone assets. So, and that's true for all the analysts, really. They're not really, but I mean, the thing you would probably want to do is, uh, I mean, as far as you could go without changing that, you could just do with the system assets, right? Any more complex sharing of information uh, would be mil uh, require a major restructuring, I think, right? Because that's kind of like compiler stuff you're talking about more, and it doesn't really do that at this point, but maybe it could do that. Um, right, so uh, more briefly about chip shape. And um, I guess th the major thing here is that, yeah, there's a system, it's available, anyone could pick it up. Uh, it's very heavily based on Docker, and, uh, uh, but you know, still there's a contribution story. There's not much, many workflow integration points. And I think if you, if you wanted to develop ShipShape more, that you really would have to start to think about that, and also think about a feedback story. So, so those are like the major <laughs> current state of ShipShape, basically. Right, so the thing I really wanted to get to was Trisium. So here we go. So we had Tricoder and ShipShape, and Trisium is what I'm currently working on. So uh, I'll see, let's see what we have here. I'll give you a quick little deep dive into Trisium. So, um, um, so this is basically, so uh, you know, um, I switched teams and I used to work in Tricoder, and now I'm working on Chromium. So I was thinking, all right, so how can we bring Tricoder to Chromium? So Chromium, um, uh, I'll tell you more about Chromium. Chromium is an open source project, right? So, uh, so this is sort of like an exercise in uh, taking the philosophy and the kind of takeaways I mentioned before and bringing them to a different landscape with different requirements. And this is all work in progress. Um, so Chromium, and I, I guess most people have heard of the Chrome uh, browser. Uh, so Chromium is the underlying open source project and that sort of feeds uh, most features of Chrome. The Chrome browser, they come from the Chromium project. Uh, the Chrome browser adds some other things. So you can, many times you can decide which one you want to install and one will give you some more things, some, more close, uh, some closed source things. So Chrome uh, as a browser is quite successful. There are, there's a billion users. 
so that's always nice uh, to have users. Um, development of the Chromium project, as you can see some numbers here, uh, it's, it's way smaller than the Google's internal code base. It's only 25 million lines of code. But then again, it's twice the size almost of the Linux kernel, so it's still fairly big. Um, yeah, and then you have some, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly large number of developers. There's some commits happening every day. Numbers are smaller, but it's, it's fairly complex because there's a lot of different platforms here. So the browser runs on, you know, it's not only Linux, it's also Windows and Mac and Mac OS and uh, Android devices and any kind of, all, uh, many other devices actually, more than I, I originally thought they would build for. So there's a lot of different build configurations, there's a lot of test configurations and stuff like this happening. Um, uh, and then some other things about how development looks like, what it looks like. Um, right, and um, just to give you an idea, this is log count, by the way. So uh, about 25, uh, 27 million lines of code, and uh, the ma majority of languages, uh, the ma well, basically 62 or so percent is C++. And then there's, there's a tail of things, all the way down to Fortran and some other weird stuff happening down here. No idea why. <laughs> um, Right, I, I think this is most of the code. There may be some other things as well. I just took the Chromium source, basically. If you check it out, that's what you get. At least uh, that was the case in October. So um, the Chromium landscape, other things, there's a bunch of tooling here. I guess, uh, so this is, I mean, uh, don't look at the details here. This is basically, there's like tools like code search and code review, and uh, there's, there's this mega interesting uh, UI for how what's building at the moment, right? Green is good and red is bad and so on. Um, so, so there's a lot of different tools, basically, is what I'm trying to say here. In the Chromium workflow, they are being developed for Chromium. It's an entirely different stack from the internal development. Um, so that's, I find that very interesting. So it's, a very, it's, it's, it's a different setup where some people are external, some are internal to Google, and you know, everyone's going through code review. It sounds like the perfect setup for something like Tricoder, right? Uh, yes, and then there's a, there's a team taking care of all of this, and that's my team, right? And we're in a lot of different time zones and so on. Right, so um, uh, let's see. So we want to. Uh, so the, the goal here is to kind of like take Tricoder and migrate idea. So there's a bunch of different things you need to think about. So you know, if uh, feedback is important, code review is a good place for this. We need to enable so we can do this in code review. That's maybe the first thing to think about, right? And then all the other stuff you need to think about. You know, we need to get the feedback in. We need to think about contributions, customization. How do we empower people to contribute and so on? How do we make things scale? And then in addition, in this context, you know, there's so many different platforms. But resources are scarce. So at peak hours, you know, all the, the all, despite all the data centers and things, we're at peak ca capacity. We can't just add analysis to all that stuff. We need to think about how to minimize the resource uh, footprint. And then there's like, can we develop the, this, this I these ideas even more? Could we go to more signals rather than probes and thinking about usability and stuff like this? So these are things, considerations, let's say, for, for how this uh, system, how, how to build a system, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so enabling workflow integration, there's work happening in the Garrett team, and they've, they've, they're really doing great work. So there's already almost supports for robot comments. Um, it's, it's actively being worked on. So uh, anyone using Garrett will actually, due to this product, soon have robot comments. So, so that great, uh, they, they were talking about it for a long time, and now they actually did it. So very happy about that. Um, right. Um, so I want to say some stuff about how this, this works, and I, I think I'm... I'm actually not leaving a lot of time for questions. So please interrupt if, if you have questions here. Um, so how does it work? So again, uh, there's some kind of pipeline here. There's a service. Uh, this is all being built. <laughs> so uh, you can see something like a flow here if you wanted to. So there's Garrett on that side, and that's going to be the code review uh, of choice for the future in, in Chromium. Um, used to be read built, and there's an actual uh, mig migration happening at, as we speak. Um, and then there's all kinds of little systems now, and the boxes have different names from before. So, you know, the internal system could use all the internal tooling, which is very well integrated. And now we're in this external world, and the Chrome infrastructure team, they're providing all their own tools. So suddenly things have different names, like Logdog and Swarming, and Swarm Bucket, and Lucy Config, and whatever. All those things are new. So the system is kind of like, yeah, okay, how do I build this kind of system with all these Chromium-specific tools? And, and this is what the result is. And you can find more information about this online. But basically, there's, there's some kind of flow here where requests are coming in. In this case, it's a polar, because that's the way Garrett works. And then you trigger some kind of flow. Something are being com some things are being computed over here, and then they go back all the way up to Garrett. And then things that are with little red dots are things you could scale up, so you have some way of handling load in the system. Uh, in brief, that's sort of what's happening here. Um, right. Um, so 
so I, I was going to mention some stuff about the sort of how the configuration. So basically, uh, the idea here is to you wanna you wanna give it the, the power and power power users to configure Tricium to be what they want it to be, as much as possible, as well as contribute to the system, add their own analyzers, share their analyzers with others, right? So the the, the key to sort of how that is done is through the configuration. So and and here's uh, here's an example where. Uh, how, how this basically works. So you have uh, this, this configuration is divided in two parts. So there's a configuration of Tricium, and then each product has their own configuration where they say what they want. So it's kind of like Tricium has some kind of things to offer. You pick the ones you want, you maybe add more stuff. And, and this is sort of what that looks like. And um, a key difference here from, from Tricoder is that you sort of express this in terms of a data flow uh, tasks that have dependencies to other things. So you'll uh, try to may say like I have PyLint for you if you want it, and uh, PyLint wants files and it gives you results to simplify things. It runs some Py files, um, and then you have some kind of implementation that is Chromium specific to the Chromium infrastructure. And then um, in addition, and, and again you could do this on the service level. You can say okay, well I have an analyzer like PyLint. It needs files. Well I have this other thing here. Uh, for Chrome infrastructure reasons, it's called an isolator. Uh, this thing here can provide you, based on change information, it, it will provide you with files and so on. But I'm not going to say how. <laughs> I'll leave that to the project, right? Because it depends on where they have their stuff, if which repository are they using, what kind of repository they're using, and so on. Um, so it's kind of like a, an abstract class, if you want. Yeah, so, so that's part of the thing in this configuration is to support this kind of incompleteness. Um, and then when you're in a project, you can say, well, I'm going to grab the stuff I want, and, and you know, if I need something that's missing something, I'll have to provide information. So in this case, if you want pilots, uh, you need to change the isolator, and you'll have to provide an implementation um, and sort of go into some of the details in how the infrastructure works. Um, right, and then you can add, you can continue to do things here. This, this one here allows you to actually add a new definition, so you can have your own little custom linter or something like this. And then you also provide implementation because otherwise you can't run. Right, so uh, just switching perspective a little bit. Um, this is the same thing here with the pylons and the chain size later in custom lint. You can sort of view this more like a flow, and this is just a w different way of looking at this. Um, the top part, well, the colors sort of indicate where they're coming from. I thought that was, uh, oh yeah, they're actually wrong text. Whether it's a uh, service specification or it's a project specific one, orange being the Product specific one, yeah. Well, based on this view, you can sort of see how you can add more things. So, uh, uh, so one thing to note here is that, so earlier I talked about stages, uh, and here stages become like data dependencies. And it's all in the configuration. So now you can add new stages via the configuration. You don't have to go in and like, you know, add things in the pipeline so much. Um, so if you wanted like Clang Tidy, which is, would be probably very useful for Chromium, you need to provide completion details from Clang and so on. So you add this through the configuration, like this. And you, and then this way you have a kind of a flexible way of adding stages, and you could just continue and add more interesting things, even dynamic information if you wanted to, depending on how much time you have to compute things and so on. Right, and then, well, there's some support for platforms and so on, and, uh, you know, to keep this a little bit brief, uh, Tricium will sort of then take a, Take a specific configuration based on your change. It's going to compute the kind of workflow you need. So, uh, in this case, you wanted Clang Tidy for Linux and Windows because they can actually give you different results. Uh, the Tricium, while running this workflow, is going to just uh, you know fork the whole thing to run it pa in parallel for more than one platform and then merge the results. And sort of that is one way of dealing with all these platforms. Sorry for skipping some details there, but I guess I need to sort of wrap things up. So, some of the takeaways. Uh, all work in progress, open source. Uh, obviously, I talked about Tricolor, so it's trying to pick up the ideas and you know bring them to this new landscape. Um, I guess one big difference is the configurability of stages, really. Um, there's a couple of future things to think about once this gets sort of off the ground, and uh, and that's so that I'm interested in, and that's uh, you know could we potentially move from probes, probes being the not useful links to something more like sensors, you know, detecting when things are not being used, making it more precise, stuff like that. that that's an interesting future uh, direction and also other ways of sort of automating other parts of the process because this is now a service that's running. You have to have someone look at the results and sort of, you know, not useful rates are bad. You have to investigate, see what you need to do about it. Are there things in that process of moderation that you could actually automate? So that's another kind of 
like interesting area where robots could take care of the system as well. Um, right, and I think I'm, I'm just gonna stop there to leave at least one or two minutes. Uh, this is just a summary of basically what I said. So uh, let's move over to, to this one and, and thank you for listening. Right, so um, let's go back here. Uh, yeah, so, so this is, uh, so the re those result boxes correspond to kind of things being pushed uh, here. So they will, they will follow uh, sort of like the note proto, basically, that I mentioned. I mentioned the findings before, uh, and that's kind of the format for results. They will show you sort of where to put the results and so on. Those things, that, that format, uh, results will be sh are sort of streamed out of the analyzers from this workflow on that form, and then the pipeline will sort of trickle them back up to Garrett, making them into robot comments. In terms of just, if, you, if that's what you're asking, in terms of just like the form. Yes, this, this is a requirement. I, I didn't go into detail, but yeah, definitely each analyzer, even though it's more of a loose contract here compared to Tricoder, where you're sort of in an API land, um, you're sort of running things on machines here. It's kind of a little bit looser, but you still have requirements in terms of what the data looks like. So data coming in will have a certain form, proto-based specifications, uh, and the results actually is something like findings, a list of findings. Mm. Right. Ah, well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, there's actually something to be said. So uh, it was very much a conscious decision to do like a native implementation. So sort of go to Chromium land and see what it's like, and then uh, having this goal, you know, see what it uh, ends up being, right? Because otherwise there's always the risk of, you know, you have this other system, actually you can't just take this uh, internal system and bring it out for all kinds of reasons. Um, so yeah, it's actually been discussed. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, so, so um, you know, but ShipShape, for instance. Uh, but then you, you're sort of, s it was designed with slightly, you know, different audience in mind. And then you have to just sort of cut a lot of corners to make it work in this context. Um, so um, yeah, there's a risk of other systems, but I think. What was that? Sorry. Uh, well, this is a big enough audience, so I think it's uh, they, they someone's paying for the job and so on. So I think that works. But um, I mean, I, I so one takeaway is maybe is sometimes it's better to sort of take the ideas and move them over, and then uh, really think about customizing for the users in that space. Uh, and it's kind of like a case for that, I guess. One of the one of the things I'm trying uh, points I'm making. Um, it doesn't always. It's not always best, right? But sometimes the generic solution for is better because it's small enough. But for something big like this, I think a custom solution is, is good actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, t initially, same kind of tooling. But the thing is, uh, you know, you start with something. So the first goal here is to sort of get Clang tidy up and running, because that exposes you to a lot of different problems you have to solve. So, and that runs internally, runs externally. Uh, but then, you know, the second phase is where you want to really do custom things for Chromium. So you custom sh security checks, for instance. People are just waiting to implement analyzers once the system's ready. So there's a lot of interest here where they want to do specific things. You know, Maybe there are specific APIs you want to analyze API usage to make sure certain patterns are not being used. So all those little things you can do will be kind of custom to Chromium. While some are more language things, you know, don't do this smart po pointer thing, would be a language thing, but you could definitely do a lot of uh, API analysis. And internally that's happening to some extent, but uh, and that's not applicable in this case. Uh, so there's there's uh, this coming, you know, it's just uh, it's uh, it's I don't know far out, but not this year. <laughs> right. All right. So I have a small show of appreciation for oh. Flash for our Flash IDP. Oh, thank you. And also some of the Oh wow. <laughs> so with that, let's thank a lot.